Who is the greatest in heaven? The apostles really want to know. That's what we're going to talk about today in Matthew 18. So the disciples come to Jesus, and this is a funny request. They ask the question, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And so he calls a child to him. You know, obviously the crowd is there. So some of those are children. He says, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. He who humbles himself, it's about humility, talks about the humility of this child is the greatest in all the kingdoms of heaven. And whoever receives a child like this receives me too. But if you cause one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better to have a millstone around your neck and thrown into the sea. Boy, that's a big drag. And in Matthew, that's the only place I believe this is said. Children are important to Jesus. And it was interesting for the time because children to the Romans and to the Greek weren't that important. Obviously, if you're Caesar, you care about who's going to take over your kingdom. But Herod the Great himself even killed his own children. Children were playthings or, you know, nice to have, or we hope a few of them live into adulthood kind of thing. But if you had a child and you didn't want that child, you just left them out in nature and left them to die in this time. Christians became famous because they would take those children and raise them as their own. Children, like women, were recognized by Jesus as being important and special. And then he even tells them, you should be more like this child, humble. Children, while they can be jerks at times, as my friends with children will tell me, they see the world in a different way through more innocent eyes. They are humble. They're not trying to scheme or gain anything. Well, they might be trying to gain a toy or some food, but they look at the Messiah, at Jesus with that humility. And he cares about them. And he also threatens anyone who tears children away from him. I won't even get into how many ways that I see this happen, you know, in my own life where parents will tear their children away from God because they don't want their kid to be a Jesus freak or what we do to children across this planet. I mean, it must make Jesus weep about our sins of how we do treat children. But we need to be more childlike. And people talk about having that childlike faith. We need to become more like that. And when we worship Jesus, that is what we're going towards. He he says it's woe to the world because of the temptation of sin. And he says it's necessary that temptations come. Every one of us, it's not by him, but I mean, every one of us is going to be tempted by sin. But it says woe to the ones whom temptation comes. And I think he means takes over someone who falls to temptation, someone who doesn't ignore temptation. Woe to them. And this is where he goes into that. If your hand causes you to sin, your foot causes you to sin, it would be better to be lame or have no hands or no feet than eternal fires. Your eyes, throw them out. Not asking for bodily dismemberment. But what he's saying is this is how important sin is. He uses these examples of the treasure where you sell everything for the treasure. Or in this case, you give up everything to avoid sin. We look at sin, I think particularly now, maybe they did then too. Well, you know, everyone sins here and there. I mean, it's this one's just a little sin or I have to sin in this case because this is really important for me to do this thing. And we think we shouldn't do it and we confess our sins maybe. But we also don't lament sin the way we should. Jeremiah, the prophet, which we'll talk about someday, when he saw his people sinning, he wept. A grown man prophet wept. Jesus wants us to have that determination not to sin. And that's why he's saying this particular relationship, this is how important not sinning is think people take it dangerously because they know that they can always come back and confess to God. And I think they don't realize that sin is like that, what they say, the lion crouching at your door. Every time you sin, it brings you farther from God. Every time you sin, you are harming another person. Every time you sin, even if it's a little sin, you are doing damage. And 
if not to someone else, to yourself. So avoid it at all cost. Avoid it at, in every way you can. Then he gives the parable of lost sheep with many of you who grew up in the church have heard this before. But he says, again, don't despise these little ones because in heaven, their angels see the face of their father. So they have their own set of angels. He gives the point of a shepherd, a man who has a hundred sheep, only 99 come back. That man will go back into the mountains. And remember at that time, there were lions in the mountain. It was dark. He didn't have flashlights. This was a dangerous endeavor, but he is going to go back into the mountains to find that one sheep. And when he finds that one lost sheep, he is happy for it. We'll hear more parables about this. So he says, it is the will of his father that these little ones should not perish. I had a funny story when I was, I did a hundred mile hike in England. And the first day we were hiking, there's sheep. If you ever want to learn about sheep, go on a hike in England. But I was walking through the fields and the sheep had come in already. And except there was one little baby lamb in the middle of the field all alone. And he was just in the middle going, Bleh. like, mom, where are you? And he realizes he is all by himself. We could say he is to blame. He should have come in with the rest of the sheep. But Jesus cares about that little lamb. He cares about those of us, I think about it for myself, who were lost and came back home. But he also thinks about it in terms of the children because he does not want them to perish. He cares about us. He cares about the little lamb lost and by himself. And then the funny thing is on this hike, and again, I am not a weepy person. I mean, this is like the two times I've been weepy in the last you know, two decades. I see that lamb crying in the field to himself, wondering where mom is. And I got a little misty there, that poor guy. And I hoped that the shepherd or the landowner was going to come back for him. But Jesus, he always comes back for us. And so I told my friend, this is just like that lamb that Jesus goes and saves. And you rejoice because of the one lost lamb. And then she probably thought I was nuts. Then he talks about if your brother sins. He gives steps on how, because again, now we're at this point, we're starting to build our church, which is the Greek word for group or selected group. He is now creating his own community. And so he's giving them ways to deal, as this group gets bigger, with problems. Right now, they have Jesus. If, if they have a fight in their group, if they disagree about things, they can come to Jesus and Jesus will solve it for him. This is about to have two big changes to it. A lot of people are going to join them. Jesus isn't going to be there. So you have to have methods and systems in place in order to deal with whatever's coming next. So if something goes wrong between you and your brother or your sister, talk to them one-on-one. -on -one. And if it works and you come to a reconciliation, you now have a brother and sister. If he doesn't listen, then go with one or two others and then talk to him. Because it says that evidence is in two or three, meaning you want to have someone else witness what this person is saying. You know, one, they can maybe convince him because there's more people there. But two, this will become a witness to what this person is saying or doing. And if they still don't listen, then you go to the church, the community, bring the community or the church in. And if they still don't do it, he says, let them be like a Gentile or a tax collector. Now, we know. Gentiles and tax collectors can be forgiven by God, so he's not condemning them to hell. He is basically saying these are now others. They are now no longer this new covenant, this new nation. They are strangers to our community. Jesus will still forgive them. They still can have everything that God offers, but just understand that they have gone astray. This may be a path of excommunication, but it doesn't have to be. Because again, we try to reach everyone we can. We try to bring everyone in to love Jesus and understand him. And if someone goes astray, there's always hope for them. Because again, it's going to be Jesus and the angels on the last day of judgment that's going to separate the weeds from the crop. But this is the pattern you use in order to go talk to someone about their sin. And again, I think this has to be important. This is not about minor bickering fights between people. This is about something substantial. We don't know what's in other people's hearts. We also don't want to go and be 
like the Pharisees and the Sadducees and say, hey, you didn't even wash your hands as if that was a spiritual issue instead of a cleanliness issue. So then he brings up that point again, that whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven, ESV. And if two of you agree on this planet, it'll be done by their father. So if it does come to something that has to happen more drastically or a rule, make sure that there's two in agreement. And then he reminds them that where two or three are gathered in his name, he'll be among them. This also can be misused. And so you have to be careful about this. My father grew up in a town where everyone belonged to the same church. And if you didn't belong to that church, they came after you. Or if you went astray of the church, maybe you didn't donate what they thought they should donate, you could get into trouble with them. This power can be abused. There's going to be places in further scripture that will talk about the role of the shepherd and what if the shepherd misuses his power goes wrong. Again, this is saying in his name, which means you don't want to take the Lord's name in vain, like the Ten Commandments say. So if you go about using this power and do this in the name of the Lord in vain, you could be in trouble for this whole situation. So Peter comes up to him and asks him, how many times do you have to forgive your brother of sin? So again, if we go to our brother who has sinned against us, we're still compelled to forgive them, right? We get forgiveness when we forgive others. We get mercy when we give mercy to others. And so this is not this conversation about an opportunity to rip our brothers away from us, but instead we still have that obligation to forgive. So Peter gives us number. Should we forgive him seven times? You know, Peter's just making up a number. And Jesus says, no, 77 times, which is also a made up number, but no more. It's endless. How many times does God have to forgive us? We should forgive others as they forgive us because we will get that forgiveness from God. Do we want God to only forgive us 77 times? Does anyone ever take account and say, whoop, there was 78, now I'm doomed? Nope. So this, both those numbers are fake numbers, but there's to give the example, no, more, forgive more. So then he gives another parable of a king who wanted to settle, meaning get paid off for all the things that his servants owed him. Now, remember in this particular time, servants or even slaves, this was a kind of slavery that was for debts. So maybe you wanted to buy a plot of land So you would act as a servant to someone so that you could gain the money to do that. Maybe you wanted something else. A lot of people came to America on that same kind of thing. We will pay for your trip over. We'll pay for your boat and your food, and we'll let you settle in our community. But you will owe the community time. So the king comes and he wants to get paid for all the different loans and debts he has for his servants. And this one guy owed 10,000 talents. Someone said that that is somewhere between 10 and $20 million right now. And someone said, well, now with inflation, it has gone up to a billion. But the whole concept is this is a lot of money. There's no way he could have paid back. And so then the king said, well, you know, then I'm going to sell your wife and your children and you, which was his obligation because the servant couldn't pay the bill. Servant begs him, please don't do that. Have patience with me king. So the king decides to have mercy, writes off his debts, no more debts for him, and gives him mercy and released him from the entire debt. So then the servant goes out and decides, woo, I'm free, or I'm free from my debt. Maybe he wants to build a house. Maybe he wants to do something else. And so he goes to all the people who owe him money. And when those people couldn't pay him, he got violent with them. It says he choked them. It's not like a a strangulation choke, but it's like a throttling. It's grabbing his throat and saying, hey, you bub, you owe me this money. And so he did that. And when that servant couldn't pay him, he had that servant put into jail, which makes it even harder for you to pay off your debt. I mean, imagine if you were a farmer, you owed a certain debt, you sell your crops in order to pay your debts, and now you're in jail with one less person on the land. Chances are you're never going to get a chance to pay this. So it was a bad move in general, but he offered no mercy to his servant in the same way he was given mercy. And so when the king heard about this, he calls him a wicked servant. He tells him what he did wrong. You didn't give mercy to somebody else. I gave mercy to you. 
And then he has that servant thrown into jail until he could pay all his debts, which again was millions of dollars. So it means never. He says, and this is what my heavenly father is going to do to every one of you. If you do not forgive your brother, it says, quote, from your heart goes back to when we were on the Sermon on the Mount. You should forgive other people like the Lord forgives you. You should give mercy. And that ends chapter 18. So you can tell this whole level of messaging is getting a lot more serious. It's kind of interesting to watch this ramp up very quickly. And again, Matthew is not about the actions as much as he is about what's said. I think he's trying to write a message book. What does God want from you? How should you act? And how are people who are acting in ways opposite of what Jesus said, how are they acting? He is trying to give us a book to live by. So my meditation for this week is to think about mercy and forgiveness of others. It is easy to get wrapped up in things that happen on a day-to-day basis, but we should be that source of forgiveness and mercy for other people. My prayer has to do with the lost sheep. I think I was the lost sheep. I was lost and separated from God, and I got brought back in. Jesus came looking for me, and I am forever grateful for that. We have to think about what we can do to bring in those lost sheep also. And what I'm going to share with other people is that fact that Father in heaven rejoices when a lost sheep comes back. He's not angry, and he's not yelling at people, but instead he's forgiving, he's showing mercy, and he rejoices at that lost sheep coming home. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening. Please tell people about this podcast if you wouldn't mind, prayer group, your church, people around you that you think would enjoy a slow roll through the Bible so we can really do a deep dive into all of this. I appreciate you listening. I pray for you every day and thank you so much. 